This is the week of the veto session in Jefferson City. We've been talking about this, it seems like, for months. In fact, I think it has been for months. And the Speaker of the Missouri House, Tim Jones, from Eureka, is back with us this afternoon for a bit of a preview of the veto session in Jeff City. Tim, how are you? I'm well, Mark. Thanks for having me on the show again. It's good to talk to you here on a Another warm summer Monday here in September. <laughs> it is a little uh, it's a little hot out there. I think this is going to finally break on Thursday afternoon. So um, speaking of hot, that'll make a nice segue. It, it, it could get a little hot in Jefferson City. When does this all get underway? Is it Wednesday? Uh, yes, Mark. It's uh, very uh, it's it, it has the makings of an historic session. And by historic, I mean there has only been one governor who has been overridden more than once in a veto session in state history. Isn't that amazing? It was Bob Holden, governor, one-term Bob, uh, who was overridden three times when he was governor in one veto session. So, you know, it's, it's hard. It's hard to do an override. We've only had 24 substantive overrides in our entire state's history. How many so are you begin- going yeah, how many are you yep. going to attempt? I was, I begin at, we begin at high noon on Wednesday. High noon on Wednesday. And um, how, how does the process work? Does this start in the House first? Mark, um, House bills that were overridden start in the House. Senate bills that were overridden start in the Senate. That makes sense. So, yep. And so at high noon, at high noon, we ring the bell, we go into session, and then the messages, the so the veto messages, are rid, are, are, are uh, read in chronological order, into the record. And as we get to each bill sponsor, that bill sponsor has the option of rising and discussing their bill and then deciding whether they want to make the motion to have the vote. Now, before that, we'll, of course, have a couple of caucus meetings, and we'll have a general idea uh, as to where we are and where the support is in the caucus. But ultimately, uh, it is up to the sponsor to go forward with the motion, um, and after they have these caucus meetings, whether they have a good feeling or not, with our advice and counsel, whether we can override a veto. Now, you have to know, I mean, let, let's talk about House Bill 253. A lot of the focus has been on HB 253. This is the big tax cut bill. It would cut individual corporate taxes across the board. There was a lot of support for this in the legislature. The governor's been on this uh, campaign all summer long, and obviously we've been talking about this because he says it's bad for the state. It's going to cut from education and other essential services. But, Mr. Speaker, you have got to know probably on this Monday before the veto session whether you have the votes or not, and you need every Republican to be on board, don't you? I do, Mark. And let's remember, we've never had 109 votes on this particular subject. This is the first time we've attempted major tax reform of returning some taxpayer money to the taxpayers because we believe they can spend it better than Jay Nixon spending it on another $5.6 million airplane so he could fly around the state next summer criticizing us about something else instead of working on governance of the state. But that's a side issue. Uh, that is tied, Mark. Uh, we, we believe that that's true. And, you know, so we had 103 votes during session. 100 Republicans and three Democrats. So we've had an uphill battle from the very beginning. But, Mark, momentum's on our side. I think it's too close to call right now. Have we picked up those additional nine Republican votes? I know there's some people out there still saying, I'm not sure, et cetera, et cetera. But, Mark, I think there's three things that are going to go through every representative's mind, especially the Republicans, when that board opens. Three things. Number one, less than a year ago, a supermajority of Missourians sent a supermajority of common-sense fiscal conservatives to the State House, And I will bet you that all 109 Republicans who won probably had somewhere on their campaign promises that they would reduce taxes and cut government spending. Mark, I would would wager. I think you're probably, yeah, you're probably right about that. I'm right on that. Number two, Mark, the only elected official in this state that has hurt education through funding has been Jay Nixon. And, Mark, I don't say that for hyperbole. Look at the budgets that Governor Nixon has proposed over the last five years and look at his withholds. He has attacked, slashed, and withheld from education. Whereas the Missouri House and Senate, Mark, we appropriated more money for education this year than ever before in state history. And we've done it every single year except for the years we held education harmless while other programs got cut because of the massive 
fiscal plunge. All right, but, and, but, 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 yeah. and I think yeah. you, we have to discuss, let, let, let's talk about these rural lawmakers, because the fact of the matter is, is you, you would, I would think that it would be a no-brainer for the Republicans to override the veto on this particular bill and across-the-board tax cuts, something they probably campaigned on. But you have rural Republicans in particular who are running scared because they get a lot of money from the state for their school districts and they're worried about the effects that that's going to have. And they're also probably worried about reelection. Those are the people that you have to to try to sway in these final moments. And Mark, here's why they're worried. Governor Nixon created the straw man crisis and used the blackmail withhold. And I say that with all sincerity, because that's what he did on July 1st of this fiscal year. With no constitutional, you know, the, the left is lighting, is beating on us now about the Constitution, right, on the, uh, on some of the other bills. Talk about an unconstitutional action. Governor Nixon defied the Constitution and withheld $400 million from education on July 1st of this year for no reason whatsoever. Mark, the fiscal year just started, but Jay Nixon said, if you do a tax cut, then I think it may hurt the budget. I know, but you know what? You're preaching to the choir here, and I've talked about that, and we've talked about that before, but the bottom line is you have to have these votes, and you have to have the Republicans right. vote for this override, and the question is, is my gut tells me, I don't think you have them right now, and isn't that a problem for Tim Jones? Uh, Mark, I'll tell you what, what the problem is going to be. The problem is going to be for individual legislators who stand in the way, if a handful of legislators stand in the way of tax relief for the first time in a century for all Missourians, they're the ones that will be held accountable next is, year. Is there any their... doubt, and I know I've answered this before, is there any doubt in your mind that there will be a vote on Wednesday on this issue? Mark, there has to be a vote. Okay. Mark, if I don't have a vote on this, then the entire state of Missouri that sent a supermajority to the Missouri House is going to look at this speaker and say, Mr. Speaker, we sent you there to reduce taxes and the size and scope of government. They're going to hold me accountable, Mark, if I am if I don't have the courage to have a vote. Mark, I believe we have over 100 people who want to support this. Are we at 109? We're working hard every day. Representative T.J. Berry, the sponsor, has been on the phone and worked this state and traveled this state this entire uh, summer. And, Mark, my third point that I was going to tell you about is the proof is in the pudding. If you look around the country at the states that are growing, they are the red states governed by common-sense, fiscally conservative Republican governors who have reduced the tax burden, regulation and have a good court system mark that's where the jobs okay. are going right. and that's where the successes are well, happening. We'll, and we'll talk we'll talk wednesday or thursday after the vote and find out where we go next if if it doesn't um get overridden let me let me just quickly ask you about um another bill how many bills by the way will you attempt to override total mark we've got uh we've got uh 12 house bills i think and there's 19 senate bills wow okay but but most of the focus is on 253 and then house bill 436 which would make it a crime to enforce certain federal gun laws in the state of missouri and i admitted yeah. candidly last week i had the chief of police here in st louis and the mayor on they don't like it as you probably know even for me this one is a, a little bit of a head scratcher i don't know if i maybe i just don't understand it well enough but are you going to be able to do an override on that bill and can you explain it at all Yes, Mark, I believe we will. And it's, it's simply this. It will only prevent the enforcement of unconstitutional federal gun laws. So, Mark, the only thing you have to do is hold up the prism of the Second Amendment. And if the Second Amendment, uh, which is the supreme law on, of gun ownership in the United States, along with the progeny court cases that have been written. And, Mark, I wrote a law journal article on this in law school. Prince of the United States. The Brady, remember the Brady Act? The Brady Act was determined to be unconstitutional because it was federal overreach. So, Mark, if we have any federal overreach, if we have Eric Holder coming in with his gun registry or Governor Nixon's Department of Revenue, another thing that we completely embarrassed him on this summer, attempting to take away our Second Amendment rights, then House Bill 436 will be the shield, will be the state's rights shield against federal encroachment and overreach into our constitutional rights to in the individual right to keep and bear arms under the u.s constitution that's all it is mark and so all this fear-mongering this you know they, they really mark well oh, what it comes down to with local law enforcement is they're afraid they're going to lose revenue on some of these items i say mark next year i'll pass the civil forfeiture bill to give all that enforcement revenue to the schools let's see if they still want to support those gun laws that they're so happy about right now that's all it comes down to mark it comes down to a loss of revenue of federal money You've always got to look at where the money is, and that's where it is on this situation. High noon on Wednesday for the veto session, which is finally here, and uh, keep us posted. I don't know if we'll have a chance. I know you'll be busy Wednesday afternoon. Maybe Thursday we'll catch up. We'll find out how this all turned out. Mark, I'd love to. And if folks want to follow all the veto session fun and excitement, look at History in the Making, Speaker Tim Jones on Twitter and Facebook.
I can't believe you actually got a, a plug in for your Twitter account, Tim. That's that's so unlike you. I'm, I'm a social media I'm messenger, kidding. Mark. I'm, 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 I'm going to reach out to those young people. How, how speaker Tim Jones with us this afternoon. He's good at that. He's getting the plug in for uh, for Twitter. I, I don't think I mean, I just don't see the numbers working in the Republicans favor on 253.